Welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. Okay, we're going to get straight into it this morning. And if you will, please grab out your swords, pull them out, draw them out. And we're going to go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. I'm going to follow on a little bit from last weekend. I'm going to read from verse 31 through to verse 38. This, for some context, is right after Jesus says, who, who, who do they say that I am? And who do you say that I am? Peter gives this incredible confession that uh, Jesus is the Christ. And um, it says in verse 31, it tells us, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Would you say that word after me? Must, must, must. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Interesting there that uh, Peter speaks as one who hears from the Father about who Jesus is being the Christ, the Son of the living God. But in the next moments, he speaks on behalf of Satan. Satan doesn't take hold of him, but he speaks on behalf of Satan. It's interesting that Satan will sometimes use us to speak on his behalf. Peter tries to rebuke Jesus. Jesus turns around and rebukes Peter and says in verse 34, calling the crowd to him, With his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If you're taking notes this morning, the title of this message is called Never Settle. Never Settle. Never Settle. This account can be found in Matthew chapter 16. It can also be found in Luke chapter 9. All bring out slightly different beautiful emphases. But here in this account in Mark, Jesus, after rebuking Peter, starts off by saying, if anyone, not just some, not just most, if anyone... The call is out for anyone. If anyone wants to come after me, who wants to follow me, who wants to pursue me, he must do this. He must deny himself, take up his cross. If anyone wants to come after me. The first question I have for you this morning is, have you made a decision to follow Jesus? Or are you just going with the flow? Have you been raised in a Christian family? Have you gone to a Christian school? Have you been dragged here by a Christian friend? Have you actually made a deliberate decision to follow Jesus? Or has it been a haphazard accident? I wonder if Jesus is is asking us today, not just who do you say that I am, but will you come after me? Will you do it? 
If you're taking notes, write this down. Be deliberate with your life's direction. Be deliberate with your life's direction. What direction are you headed in? Do you know the direction that you're headed in? Are you in cruise control? If you're ever unsure what direction you're headed in, have a look at what holds your attention and affection. Where are your eyes fixed? Where is your heart set? That will give you an idea of the direction that you're headed in. I was in the car with the children at driving and I've got my teacher hat on but I'm realizing I need to have my learner hat on as God speaks through my children again as parents know they do. And so as I was talking with the girls about a week ago, I said, hey girls, how do you know what your future looks like, what, what's going to happen in the future, what, how you're going to end up? And one of them pipes up and says, I think it's your five closest friends. I said, hey, I think it's your five closest friends will show you the type of person that you'll become when you're older. I thought, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? If you don't know what direction you're headed in and you haven't made a decision, by default, have a look at the environment you're in at the moment. And if you're not happy, make the change. Be deliberate about it. May there be some sort of intentionality with the direction that you're headed. What has your attention and what holds your affection that may very well be a picture of your future Jesus says come after me come after me if you're to come up maybe you're at, maybe you've never actually made a deliberate decision to follow Jesus this might be grade 101 but it's often grade one that we gloss over and we try to do grade two, grade three, grade four. We haven't learned to read yet. We haven't learned how to, the syllables work. We haven't learned simple maths. Have you made a decision yet to follow Jesus? Making decisions and being intentional is so important to our future because the future that we live is often formed out of the decisions we make today. I must thank my parents because from a young age, my parents modeled to me the importance of keeping myself pure before marriage. And one thing that was modeled to me, I'm aware we've got children in the service, was to not be physically intimate with another woman until marriage. And it was only because I had that decision made decades prior, many, many years prior. I shouldn't say decades. It was more years prior, maybe a decade. <laughs> it was only because I made that decision well in advance that it was far easier for me to make the right move once marriage came. It was a decision that was made way back when. Just like following Jesus. Once you make a decision to follow Jesus... The rest of your decisions in life are a lot easier. See, once I've given him the keys to drive my car, he's driving the whole time. I'm just along for the ride. And if I'm ever in doubt, I just pick up this amazing book and or I sit with him in his presence and he leads me, he guides me as well as empowering me to make those decisions. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Maybe you're at the crossroads today. As I was praying, I really saw this, that a number of us are at the crossroads of life. Maybe it's not the crossroads of salvation. Maybe you're just at a crossroad in where you are. Have you yet made a decision on what God is saying? Have you yet made the decision to wholeheartedly pursue him, to become a disciple? Because there is no such thing as an accidental disciple. Did you know that? <laughs> there is no such thing 
as an accidental disciple. Jesus doesn't take or make accidental disciples. I tell you who does. Satan does though. Satan does. He will do whatever he can to get you off the narrow path. He will do whatever he can to distract you from putting Jesus first, from pursuing him. Whether it be the gold, the glitz, the girls, whatever it is, he will do what he can to throw you off that path. Let's check out Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. I'm putting on the spot, aren't I, Mr. Wiseman? Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it, enter by it are, are what? Many. Many people will go down the wrong path. Many, not just a few, many. Let's read on. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Do you know the life of a disciple is not easy? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? It's not easy. It's simple in many respects in that we follow Jesus but it's really quite difficult at times. It's really hard. Salvation is a free gift given by grace. But discipleship will cost you everything. It will cost you everything. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It says in verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What does it mean to carry your cross? Well, in a nutshell, to deny yourself for the sake of Christ. That's what it is. It's self-denial, not just denial, not just denying yourself of stuff, but self-denial for the sake of Jesus. And so here's the call for us to, uh, here's point number two. Count the cost of your cross. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. That means we all have a cross. Every single one of us has a cross. And Jesus says, I've got my cross. This is before he died. I've got my cross but you've got yours. Now, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, what was he effectively saying? Carry a cross. Do you know the cross at that point? They knew what the cross represented. It wasn't just one of those um, little cute dangly gold things that we hang around our, <laughs> our neck. It, it's not one of those wonderful little earrings that the ladies wear with the cross on it that we've um, made look really nice and pretty. It was actually quite an offensive thing. The cross was was representative of a criminal's death. It represented pain. It represented difficulty. It represented torture. It represented humiliation. It represented suffering. It represented death. So when Jesus, in predicting his future, remember he says, I'm going to suffer many things. It's going to happen to me. He then says, if you want to come after me, you've got to carry your cross deny yourself and follow me i wonder i wonder what the disciples would have thought at that moment because it would have been hard enough for them to wrap their head around their messiah their king the christ who was just professed he's then saying what jesus you're going to suffer you're going to die no this can't happen no this can't happen jesus says not only is it going to happen to me it's going to happen to you. And sometimes I think we have such a sterile view of Christianity that everything is cotton wooled for us. And we think that Christianity is about just jumping on board to a holy huddle. And that we will become immune to the challenges of life. No, quite the opposite, in fact. <laughs> as soon as you 
give your life to Jesus, a lot of the time the troubles tend to start. But that's when the joy ride begins. I tell you, I have lived my life for Jesus entirely. I gave my life, made a mature decision for Jesus at the age of 18 years old. I would take one year that I would live since then, any one of those years, and I would choose to live that than the rest of the previous 18 years combined. It is the greatest journey ever. I don't want a cushy life. I want a Christ-like life. I don't know about you, but the world is selling us a lie. But see, it's Satan, we know, that is the father of the lies. He is a deceiver of the nations. And he uses people, he uses systems, he even uses uh, uh, governments, he even uses religious sectors, religious setups to distract us, to depress us, to confuse us. But there's only one being, one person who is perfect who speaks the truth. That's God himself, shown clearly in Jesus. So we must all count the cost of our own cross. What does the cross look like? Well, your your momentary trial of a broken down washing machine is probably not your cross. The fact that when you got out of the car this morning, you banged your elbow on the door, that's probably not your cross. I don't, I could be wrong here, but I don't think that's what Jesus was referring to. I don't. I know you've probably got a couple of extra knots in your hair this morning when you're brushing it out. That's probably not the cross. It's probably not something like that. It's probably not even, it's probably not even the fact that you're sick right now that that's your cross. Could be wrong. It may, maybe it's not even the fact that you lost your job that that's your cross. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That is so vanilla. Jesus is talking about giving up your life for the sake of Him. For, for His sake. For the sake of the gospel, when you forego comforts, conveniences in this life for the sake of him, that's what he's referring to. But he says to us, will you count the cost of your cross? In fact, um, in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 9, it says, and in verse 23... It says that you would carry your cross daily. Daily. Check it out in verse 23 of chapter 9. That we, he would carry his cross every day. Not just once at salvation, but every day. Which means we, we are saved at one point in history. We give our life to him. But that shows itself every single day through the decisions that we make. Isn't that pretty cool? Every day I'm saved and I'm being saved and I will be saved. Every day, every single day. And here's, a, here's another great point, that what we give up, what we give to Him, what we surrender to Him, what we yield to Him is never lost. We only get from that. Which is why we should give what we can't keep in exchange for what we can't lose. Give what you can't keep in exchange for what you can't lose. Jim Elliott coined something very similar to that a number of years ago, the famous missionary. It's like a seed. When I have a seed, I'm getting into gardening these days, right? Uh, Some of you have seen my handiwork when I brought up on stage. and It's like seeds, uh, When I get a seed and I put it in the ground, I'm not losing that seed, am I? I'm gaining a plant. When I sow a seed, I'm not losing, I'm gaining. And it's just like us in our hearts, our lives, our souls. When we give our souls to Him, we're not losing it, we're gaining something far better. Have you given Him your everything yet? Do you see a replacement taking place? Or are you just trying to add him to something you're still trying to hold on to? The challenge that we have in the world is that um, 
our, 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 our sense of humanity across the board at the moment is teaching for us, discipling us to cling on to every single right that we can. I'm not against rights. I'm not against that at all. I think rights are good. But he's far more important. And so in, in our efforts to cling to our rights, to cling to being right, to cling to having and holding, we're losing other things. What did Jesus do? He gave it all so we could have it all. He surrendered. He yielded of himself. And he modeled that for us. So who was the one that was on the cross first? It was Jesus. Who carried his cross first? It was Jesus. He is the forerunner and the fulfillment for us. And he says, just as I have done, you do also. So we enjoy this participation with Jesus. He's not just telling us to do something that he himself has not done and is not now doing through us. So he says, come, let's do this together. What is he calling for you to let go of? What's your cross? What does it mean to you? What you give to him, understand you're putting it in his hand. And watch him do a miracle with it. I had a very expensive um, exercise I did with my girls last year at the faith offering. I, I was talking to the Lord as I'm talking to them about uh, what will you give? How's God leading you in the faith offering? And each of my three girls didn't get a specific amount. And to be honest, I didn't get a specific amount either. We just, we encourage just err on the side of generosity. But something that I said to the Lord, I said, all right, Lord, what I'm going to do is whatever they decide to give, I'm going to double and give it back to them. Right? I'm thinking, oh, five bucks, ten bucks. <laughs> oh, here I am. See, so here I've got my teaching hat on again, but I've got my learner hat on at this moment. I've got to be careful. I, I, it was probably only a few weeks ago I finished paying that off. It took, me, it took me over six months to pay that back. The girls, I'm concerned that they think this is a precedent for, 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 for years to come. I had to be very clear. Hey, listen, girls, no, 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 no. You cannot expect this. Your dad is in big trouble here, right? Right. So, but, but they understood the picture here that as you sow, you reap. What you give will be multiplied. Don't hold on to your life. Let it go and put it in God's hand. See what He can do with it. But you've got to understand there is a cost in this moment, which from an eternal setting, is it really a cost? Is it really when you consider what you get back? It's it's an investment. It's an incredible investment. So the first point, be deliberate with your life's direction. The second point, count the cost of your cross. The third thing is never settle with the devil. Never settle with the devil. Never settle with the devil. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Gee, I tell you what, that's now, isn't it? Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. You know, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 5 and through to about, around about verse 8, Jesus had an encounter with Satan when he was tempted. Do you remember that? And Jesus said a couple of things. He says, hey, aren't you hungry? Turn, turn this stone into bread. Hey, you know, let me take you up to this place to look out. You know what? If you uh, just, just worship me, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you all. So Jesus had overcome Satan's temptation. He's a lure. So Jesus modeled this for us. He, uh, he had an opportunity to settle with the devil. Jesus was tempted like us, but he overcame.
Has Satan ever tried to use people to wrestle your soul from you? Now, your soul doesn't necessarily mean your salvation. That's not what I think he's saying here. Your soul is who you are, your peace, your joy, your shalom. Has Satan used people, systems, things, situations to try and wrestle that from you? How does he do that? There are a couple of reasons, uh, uh, a couple of ways, a couple of means that Satan will try to uh, take your soul, to buy your soul from you. In the world that we live, perhaps it's the life consumerism. Consumerism, that you must have and you must have more. You need more if you just had that car, if you just had that house, if you just had a higher income. If you just had, if you just wanted more, you needed more, that'll fill the void. I'm here to tell you, that's a lie. Straight from the pit. It's an absolute load of garbage. So maybe for some of us, we've got to turn the box off. Put the phone down. Don't buy into the lie. Because even if he promises you the whole world, you should never settle with the devil never sell your soul even if he offers you the whole world consumerism is one another one is comfort i mentioned this before comfort comfort when things get a little bit difficult he says hey wouldn't it be easier if you just you just veered off that path a little bit you're following jesus you're putting him first but don't you feel lonely Don't you feel like you don't have enough? Don't you feel abandoned? Don't you feel betrayed? Don't you feel hurt? Come on, let me show you a different way. And then what happens is temptation sets in. Satan prays, the enemy prays on the internal desires that come from within us, but he prays on that in an effort to, to, to dissuade us and get us off the path of pursuing Jesus. And what happens for us? This is what I see happen time and time and time again. For people that follow Jesus, as a way to justify sinful behavior, we hide ourselves. We make decisions which we know are wrong. We err, we meander, we enter into sinfulness and uh, behavior that perhaps is destructive, addictive, whatever that might be. And then we start to point the finger at other people. Oh, no, no, no. But that was, I was hurt by that person. Oh, that church made me do it. They're just a bunch of, oh, that God, he did this. How could he do this? Well, we're playing into the enemy's narrative. Remember the garden? God didn't really say that, did he? Remember the, the days in the wilderness where Jesus was tempted. Doesn't it say this? And so Satan will try to wrestle away your soul, to take it from you. It's, it's, it's not his to take. It's, it's ours to give in. Don't let him have it. Whatever promise he gives to you is a lie. It's a false promise. I'm here to tell you, friends, stay true. Be on the straight and narrow. As difficult as it is at times, you might feel like, uh, whether it be a lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, whatever it is, don't give in. With God's help, keep your eyes set on Him, on the prize. And you might say, but it's just so hard. I, 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 it just gets so hard. It's so difficult. It does. It does. In James, it tells us this. James 1, 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, give birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So what's happening here? There is a seed in here, and uh, we, are, we have these fallen, sinful, carnal, worldly natures calling for us to do the wrong thing 
And what's James saying to do? When that happens, before it gives birth to sin, what do we do? Say no, rest right there. How do we, how do we deny ourselves? How do we take up our cross? When it starts off in here, when it starts off in you and you have the thought to sin, the desire to sin at that moment with God's help say, no, I'm not going to do it. I am going to say yes to God. And the yes to Him should be far louder than the no to sin. That's the way to overcome sin. We say yes to Him as we say no to sin. Say, yes, I'm following Him. Yes, it does get hard, but yes, I'm going to pursue Him. Yes, it does get hard, but yes, I'll take up my cross with His help. And you know what? Part of you, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to feel the suffering in your body, in, in yourself, in your soul. Since therefore, 1 Peter chapter 4, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. Have you ever been maligned when you don't, don't join in with sinful behaviors? I tell you, when I came to Christ in university, I stopped going to the parties. I just, I couldn't do it anymore. Because God got hold of me. And they used to make fun of me. Hey, priesty, God boy, churchy, you name it. I got it all. And you know what? I kind of sadistically liked it. I kind of enjoyed it. What, you're not going to get drunk anymore. You're not going to come out to the parties anymore. Look at you. You're going to be priesty, priesty, Jesus. I got it all. It was fantastic. That's all right. I got one of them to come to church, got saved, Mike Bazidis. They're going to malign you. You're not going to, you're not going to look and smell the same as them. But you know what? That's because you are not the, the same as them. You're a new creation. And we don't have to succumb and give in to the world's way of living anymore. They'll malign you and they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And here is where we're going to land today. In the spirit. In the spirit. How do we do all of this? It's in the Spirit. It's in Christ. It's in Christ. Galatians 2.20 tells us this very, very clearly. For I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life. I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So by the Spirit, we have faith and we trust God. It's like this. Okay, I need my Holy Spirit. Come here, Holy Spirit, and help me out here. Isn't he a good-looking Holy Spirit, this guy? All right, Holy Spirit. Now, I'm coming to the cross. I'm, as I come to Christ, Christ tells me now. This is really heavy. This is really heavy, right? I couldn't do this myself. But I've got the Holy Spirit. I've got the Holy Spirit. So when we try to carry the cross by ourselves, we'll fall. I can't can't do this myself. It's too big. But the beautiful thing is that because Jesus Christ himself has carried the cross, he gives me his spirit to help me do it. That's the beauty. See, that's the beauty of Christianity. It's not a law or works-based ideology. It's one that says, by grace you are saved. It's by grace you are set free. It is by grace you are sanctified. This here is a sanctifying experience. It's a purifying experience. When we carry our cross, our old nature is being killed off continually. In one sense, we've been crucified. In another sense, we're still being crucified because there are parts of me that still must die. And if you haven't worked it out yet, I'm here to tell you, 
Discipleship will kill you. It will. The process is designed in such a way, God designs discipleship in such a way that we fall away and He shines. My question as we finish today is, as you picture yourself carrying your cross, what does it mean to you? What parts of you are the Lord Jesus saying, I want that to fall to one side. I want that to just be gone. I want that to be surrendered. And it may be really difficult. Really difficult. But we've got God to help us. Thanks, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit so strong is he so so strong isn't he and we should never underestimate this person of the trinity he is here not just to direct but to empower and i've made mistakes in my life as the music team comes i've made mistakes in my life where i i've worked out exactly what he said to do but i have not relied on his strength to get that done What is it that you need to surrender today? What does carrying your cross look like for you? Are you willing to follow Jesus? Even if it means losing some of your closest friends. What does it mean to you? Are you willing to follow Jesus and carry your cross? Even if it means losing your reputation. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus and carry your cross if it means alienation from your family? Maybe for some of these things, maybe other things, you've already experienced this. This may very well not happen, but are you willing for it to happen? Jesus even says, are you willing to lose your life is there a willingness for that? Because it's in that willingness and obedience to surrender that we find freedom. It's the people that have given it all and surrendered all that tend to be the most joy-filled people you'll ever meet. That is called the aroma of Christ. The people that have nailed their passions to the cross that have been willing to lose their reputation their loved ones the willingness for that for the for the sake of jesus christ it's those people that smell and look like jesus the most because there are there is a closer participation with the life death and resurrection of christ himself can we pray father we want to thank you for your ministry this morning and I ask that you would continue to speak to us by your spirit with what it means for us personally to carry our own cross we thank you that you've gone before us we thank you that you go with us but Lord we ask that you would help us to internalize this revelation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.